And I'm actually so grateful looking back on this now that this happened. He manifested himself to me in his house. Hey guys. Okay, so there is an experience that I had that I completely forgot to share in this video. So I recorded all of this two days ago and not that it matters. So I recorded on Tuesday and today is Thursday and I'm just now sitting down to edit this video and I was just reading my scriptures. I was praying, listening to all of this crazy wind outside and you guys, it's so interesting. The scripture that I was reading is what reminded me of this experience that I wanted to share in this video and I forgot. <laughs> so it's it's amazing. Um, so actually, let me grab right now. I'm going to grab this scripture and just kind of share it with you a little bit because I really liked it. And then I'm going to share with you my experience. So, okay. Um, I was reading in 2 Nephi chapter 26. I know I'm behind with the Come Follow Me study. Um, I'm not behind with, with our family. We read together every week. But as far as my personal scripture study, I do get behind from time to time. <laughs> so anyways, but you know what? I think I've shared this before. It always works out because every chapter I am reading at the time I'm reading it always applies to something that's going on in my life at that time. So maybe I'll tell you the story first. Let me do that. I'm going to tell you the story first, and then I'm going to share with you this scripture that is a definite confirmation of my experience. So, okay, so this was a couple of weeks ago. My husband and I went to the temple. It was on a Saturday, and we got to the Ogden Temple to do an endowment. And on the way there, I just was feeling kind of interesting. I couldn't figure it out, but something just felt a little strange. Um, but, you know, I just chose to ignore it. And I always tell my husband, <laughs> because his car always smells like a brand new car. I don't know how he does it, but he can have a car for years. And he manages to always keep it smelling like a brand new car. My car has a lot of kids in it and traffic and the dog. <laughs> and, you know, people eat in the car. I have air fresheners I put in the car. So it definitely has its own smell. But there's something about a new car smell that I actually don't like. <laughs> so I know I'm different that way. Maybe that's a man versus woman thing. I don't know. But my husband loves the smell of a new car. And I think my son does as well. But me and one of my daughters, we both get a little put off by that smell. It just isn't the best. <laughs> so it's fine. I can be okay with it unless there's other conditions going on, like if it's really sunny outside or hot and there's crazy driving going on or curvy roads and then the smell of the new car on top of it usually gives me a headache and I just don't feel that great. So anyways, I was blaming it on that. Well, we got to the temple, and as we were walking up towards the front, that feeling was still there. I couldn't shake it, and suddenly I started to feel just a little bit lightheaded, and it felt kind of like a blood circulation kind of thing. I couldn't figure out what it was, but the way I can best describe it is sort of like maybe if your blood sugar is low because you've gone all day without eating, or you're low on iron, but at the same time, you're not feeling too great, so you really don't want to eat anything. <laughs> So I don't know. It was just a weird feeling. And again, I just kind of ignored it. And I walked into the temple and I walked over to the changing rooms and suddenly I just kind of felt my heart starting to race. And I didn't know if that was maybe a little bit of anxiety or worry because I wasn't feeling too great. And here I was about to go do an hour and a half session. <laughs> you know, I just wasn't sure. So again, I just ignored it and I changed into my clothes and as I was changing, I started to say a little prayer in the locker room, and I just prayed that this feeling would go away, that I would be able to feel better, that everything would be fine, and especially because we were doing a name 
in my husband's family tree, which is always really important because there's a lot of work that needs to be done in his tree, and it's taken a long time to be able to find the names and do the work. That's a whole nother story for another video, but we had this name and I was going to be doing his ancestors' work. So I felt like this was important. You know, why would I be feeling sick? Why would I be prevented from doing her work? So again, I just pushed forward and I kept thinking I'm doing the right thing. I'm supposed to be here doing this work. So it's going to happen, right? It's, it's all going to be fine. So anyways, I came out of the dressing room, started walking upstairs. And as I was going up the flight of stairs, it got worse and worse. And I started to feel more lightheaded and just like something wasn't right. Um, I'm not one to pass out. I've never passed out before, so I don't know what that feels like, but it felt like this was close to what that must feel like. <laughs> so I was just kind of starting to think, oh no, what do I do? I don't know what to do, you know? I guess I'll just keep going up these stairs. So I knew my husband was probably already up there. So I went up and I went into the chapel and right when I saw him, I just had this kind of panicky feeling. My heart started racing again and I felt like I just needed to step out for a minute, maybe get another drink of water. So I handed him my things and I just said, I will be right back. And I went out and asked one of the workers where the closest bathroom was and she sent me down the hall. I went into this restroom. Once I was in there, I thought, well, what do I do now? <laughs> I don't need to use the restroom, but I don't want to go back out there, but I, I just don't know what to do. So again, I said another prayer and I just prayed and I said out loud, I asked the Savior if he would just be there with me. I said, this is your house. I'm in your house. I'm doing your work. And, um, you know, it's always a sacrifice to come here. And we came all this way and I'm here. I want to do this work. Can you please help me? Can you help me to feel better? Can you help me to be able to, to do this session? Well, I ended the prayer. I came out and as soon as I came out and turned that corner, I just felt like I needed to sit down. And there was a an ordinance worker standing there. She looked at me and I said to her, um, is it okay if I just wait out here for a minute? I just need to sit down. And she just kind of looks at me and I said, I'm just not feeling well and I don't know why. I just feel really lightheaded and a little bit dizzy. And so she said, oh, go ahead, sit down. Yes, please have a seat. Let's figure this out. Right when I sat down, I saw the people coming out of the chapel ready to go up the stairs to do the endowment. And I thought, oh no, they're already leaving. They're going to leave without me. What do I do? <laughs> so um, she goes and gets another ordinance worker and they both come over and she said to him, she's not feeling well. What should she do? And, and I said, my husband's in there. I just want him to know that I'm out here. And he said, oh yeah, we need to go stop your husband so he doesn't go all the way up into the room. And then we have to interrupt and have him come out. And I said, no, 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 no. I don't want to stop him. We're already here. So maybe he can just go on ahead and do the ordinance and I will just wait for him. I'll just wait. And if I feel better, maybe I'll just do a quick initiatory or something. Um, but I don't want to stop him. We came all this way. We made the sacrifice to be here. You know, let's, let's do this. He said, but I still need to let him know. So he's not waiting for you. And I said, okay, how much time do we have? They're just starting to walk up. Like, do I have two minutes, three minutes? What do I have? I need, I need to know. <laughs> and so, and so um, he said, well, maybe, maybe you need a drink of water. There's a drinking fountain right over there. Well, you know, why don't you just go get a drink? Because I was kind of feeling a little dehydrated. I wondered if I was dehydrated, even though I'd had water. I just couldn't figure it out. And I said, yeah, I've already had a few drinks of water since I've been here. Um, but yeah, it, it wouldn't hurt to have more. And he said, well, we'll go get some. And then the other ordinance worker said, oh, well, don't make her get up. She's feeling lightheaded. She needs to stay seated. Let's bring the water to her. So they went and grabbed another ordinance worker who went and got a cup of water and brought it to me. And, and I said, thank you. And Anyways, this sweet ordinance worker, <laughs> she just leaned down and said to me, it was so funny, she said, I think you're pregnant. And I just laughed at her. And I'm not, you guys, I'm not. <laughs> and I knew I wasn't. I said to her, no, there, there's no way that I am. That's not what this is. Trust me, I, I know it. And she said, oh no, I, I have a knack for these kinds of things. Every time I, I tell someone they're pregnant, I always find out later that, that they were. <laughs> So she said, I promise you that's what's going on. And I said, no, nope, no, nope, I promise you I'm not. I'm I'm older. My kids are older. Um, I trust me, there's been no accident. <laughs> like, 
Like I know 100% that I am not and I don't need to go into detail how I know that, but I know it. <laughs> so bless her heart, as sweet as she was trying to be, she was so convinced that that's what was going on and I knew that it wasn't, but I didn't want to have that conversation <laughs> in front of everyone. So I just let her say that. She said it a few more times. And then um, finally the third lady came over and she said, okay, well, we've got to figure this out right now. What what do we do? She says, we've sent for your husband. And so, so the man went and he found my husband and brought him over to me. And Manuel was like, well, what's going on? Are you okay? And, you know, in the back of his mind, he's thinking about my upcoming mammogram appointment that I haven't had yet. And I kind of thought, oh no, I wonder if he's wondering if that's what this is. And, you know, there's something really wrong with me and I don't want to worry him. I'm pretty sure that's not what this is. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I couldn't figure it out. I um, knew something was wrong, but I just needed to take a leap of faith. And I said, honey, either, either way, if I can't go up there, I want you to go up there and I'll just don't worry about me. I'll figure this out. And he's like, well, I don't want to leave you. I said, no, it's fine. And, and then suddenly I just stood up. I stood up and I said, you know what? I'm just going to walk with you up there to the endowment room and maybe by then I'll feel better. Either way, I just have to move forward. I can't just sit here. Nothing's going to come from me just sitting here. If I'm going to get better, I'm going to get better. Either I get better sitting here or I get better moving forward, right? Moving up those stairs. And if I'm going to get worse, well, I'll get worse either sitting here or moving towards that next level, that next floor. <laughs> so either way, I'm going. So I had a cup of water in my hand and I was holding on to him and they said, well, you're going to take the elevator. So they put us on the elevator. They took us up. Everybody was already in the room. And while we were going up the elevator, I said, well, um, tell me, can I, can I sit in the very back? Maybe if I sit right by the door, I can just try this out. And if something happens, you know, worse comes to worse, I, I can just get up and, and walk out. And they said, yeah, you could probably do that. But what you have to do is if there's something wrong, you have to stand. You don't just walk out. You, you wait and you stand and then they stop everything and then they help you. They escort you out. And I thought, oh, that feels awkward. I don't think I would want to just stand up in the middle of something, especially if it's on the part <laughs> where they ask you if you want to decline going through with the ordinance because you're not willing to make a covenant with the Lord. Um, what if that's the part where I needed to stand? <laughs> You know, everybody looks back at me and feels bad. <laughs> so, oh, my mind was just racing and I thought, oh, I don't know, but I just, I need to do this. I need to go in there. I came all this way and I've prayed here in the Lord's house, in his temple. I've prayed to him that I'm here and I'm ready to do this work and I want to, my heart wants to, even though my body doesn't want to, um, I, I believe in miracles. I'm praying for a miracle. So... It was very difficult, but I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And I was a little bit scared. And I can't tell you the last time I ever felt scared while I was in the temple, but I knew that was all me. So we went in and um, they seated us on the back row. And um, I thought maybe I could just sit right next to my husband, but um, I did scoot over and sit by the sisters who were on the back row and he sat by the brethren and we were right there by the door and, you know, it was the most interesting experience I've ever had doing an endowment. And I'm actually so grateful looking back on this now that this happened because I learned a lot that day and it was amazing. <laughs> so anyways, um, as soon as I sat down, everything just started. You know, they were waiting on us. Everything started. And I quickly realized as I looked around that all of the people who were sitting on the back row, like we were, all had some kind of a an issue or a disability or an illness and so they had to be on the back row and i'd never noticed that before i think i've only sat on the back row one other time and i'd never seen anything like this before but on this particular day at this particular time the back row was full of people who were ill um had had disabilities had something going on some things that were very distracting and so that's why they they needed to be on the back row and it was such a humbling experience and because it was so humbling the spirit was so strong i was like tearing up <laughs> you guys and I worried that if I teared up, my husband would look over and he would worry that something was not right, you know, that I was getting worse. I was feeling very sick. Um, so I was trying not to tear up so that he would worry about me, but I was feeling the spirit. That's why I was tearing up. 
And so just to give you some examples of, of what I was seeing, um, there was, first of all, there was a sister sitting next to me who didn't speak any English. So she had a headset on and it was just so beautiful and humbling to sit next to her and, and watch her go through this experience of the endowment in her native language, but in a room full of people who were experiencing it in English. And so there was a little delay. So as we would do things, she was always right behind us because there was that delay through her device. Um, but I looked over at her a few times and she looked over at me and we both just gave each other this beautiful, warm smile of friendship. <laughs> just that we were so happy to be there and it was awesome because we never spoke a word to each other but we spoke more than words could say just through a glance and a smile so I immediately felt better when I smiled at the person next to me I felt a little bit better um, and then next to her there was a gentleman who had an oxygen machine and it was really loud you could hear the oxygen pumping and it would make these sounds and and then every now and then he would have to stand up and then he would sit down and and then every now and then he would have these spasms with his body and his arm would shoot out or his leg would kick up or he would just kind of shake and then he would stand up and sit down and so he was very active and the funny thing is you guys the sound of his breathing machine his oxygen machine was actually like a, a soothing background white noise for me. <laughs> so normally that would be something that would be a big distraction, but because I was already uncomfortable, I wasn't feeling well, that took away from my sickness and I just focused on the sound of his breathing machine, you know, a reminder to breathe in, breathe out. So it actually helped <laughs> in a strange way, it helped. Um, and then there were some other people with some disabilities that weren't very distracting. Um, but then there was this man who had a row all to himself right in front of the back row. And he had to stand the whole time. Um, whatever was going on with him, probably back problems, he could not sit. So bless his heart, he stood the whole time. And you know, what is that? That's about an hour and a half of standing. And when it got to be too much, he would kind of pace back and forth up and down the row and kind of twist and move from side to side. And he was a younger man, um, either my age or just a little bit older than me. But it was crazy just to watch him, you know, his dedication to be there, to make that kind of a sacrifice, to be there, to be in the temple doing this work. And it was so humbling. As I looked around at all these other people who clearly were suffering, right, in, in one way or another, they were all suffering, yet they were all there in the house of the Lord doing his work. That was more important than their suffering. And I was so taken back by that. It was so incredible. I'm feeling it right now. I've got my, my spirit bumps. My hairs are standing up on end all over my arm. Um, it was just a sight to see. And I... In that moment, seeing all of that, again, just took away from what I was feeling. I forgot about myself and how I didn't feel very good because I was focusing on everyone around me and I could clearly see that they weren't feeling good, that they were suffering physically in one way or another, yet they were there. So I knew that I could do it too. If they could do it, I could do it. Well, I sat there and as the video started to play and the session began, um, I just continued to talk to the Lord in my mind and I just said, Lord, please help me get me through this. I want to be here. There's no turning back. I'm here. I'm doing this. <laughs> please get me through this. Help me just feel better and better and better. And, um, oh, it's funny. The sun's kind of coming out right now as I'm saying this. And suddenly it came into my mind as clear as day instructions of what I should do that would help me feel better. And right away it came into my mind as if someone was speaking to me. Um, I heard, just imagine that you're at home. You know, you're in my house. You're in the Lord's house. Well, what does it feel like when you're at home? When you're in your house, you feel so comfortable. So even if you were feeling sick like you are right now, but you were at home, you wouldn't be so worried. You'd be just fine. So just tell yourself that you're at home. You're here in the temple, but you're at home. You guys, it completely made sense. <laughs> and the minute 
I decided to do that, to just imagine that I'm at home. I'm in the comfort of my own home, sitting on my couch, right? Surrounded by people who love me. Everything's fine. The minute I did that, you guys, suddenly I just felt this huge weight come off of my shoulders and my burden was lightened. And um, in that moment, it was just so profound because what I was going through, what I was suffering with was nothing compared to these other people around me who had far more severe illnesses and disabilities that they were struggling with and they could do it. And here I just felt a little bit lightheaded. You know, it was so silly to me. I mean, I just kind of thought to myself, I can't believe, <laughs> I can't believe um, I've let this worry me. You know, it's nothing compared to these other people and, and they're here doing this. I am in the house of the Lord. I should feel comfortable. I should feel at home. This should feel like I'm home. And so the minute I thought that, you guys, it just changed everything. I just felt everything come off of me. I felt that heaviness, that weight, that fear come off of me. And I was able to just sink more into my chair and just experience the ordinance and enjoy that whole session. And every minute that went by, I felt better and better and better until by the end of the session, when it was all over and I got up and I went through the veil, I felt 100% fine. It was the strangest thing, you guys. And I had prayed for a miracle and I got my miracle. What was so beautiful about this experience is when you're doing the endowment, it's all about the Lord. He's 100% a part of that whole ordinance. And as it showed pictures of Christ up on the screen and you can hear his voice talking, I just felt his presence from head to toe. And I was reminded of what President Nelson told us at this last general conference, that as we increase our time in the temple, that the Lord would start manifesting himself to us in personal ways. And that was a very personal way for me. I felt the love of the Lord. I felt him in his house. I felt that he was there with me. Um, I felt that he was there guiding me, walking me through that moment, helping me get through it, helping me feel better. And by the time I was done, I was 100% better. And I was so happy. I was so overjoyed. I felt the spirit so strong throughout that whole endowment. I never once had my mind wander or I never once felt sleepy. I was just soaking it in. And anyways, it's funny because when I came back towards the veil, that ordinance worker was standing there smiling at me. <laughs> she said, oh, how are you? Are you okay? And I said, oh yeah, I, I feel great. And my husband looked over quite a few times at me throughout the whole ordinance and he just kept saying, are you okay? Are you okay? And I was like, yep, I'm fine. I'm fine. Um, but it was funny because before I went into that room, that ordinance worker said to me one more time, she said, oh, oh, I wished I had your phone number. I, I wished I had time to get your phone number because I would love to call you a couple months from now to see if I was right, to see if you were pregnant. <laughs> so I thought, oh goodness, it's okay. It's fine. It's all good. Uh, anyways, um, there was another ordinance worker who was a part of all of this. And when I came out of this celestial room, she was standing at the top of the stairs and she said, Oh, I've been wondering about you and thinking about you. How are you? Are you okay? And I said to her right then and there, it just came into my mind, you guys. And I knew what was wrong with me. <laughs> I figured it out. I was enlightened. It came into my mind. And I said to her, you know what? I, I think I know exactly what was going on. And she said, oh, well, tell me. I want to know. And I said, you guys, I can't believe I didn't figure this out. I can't believe it. But that morning, I had taken a brand new medication. I take a stimulant for ADHD, and I don't take it all the time. I just take it every now and then, especially on days where I feel like my thoughts are just all over the place and I can't focus and you know, it really affects my day and getting things done. And so on days when I need to focus and concentrate, I will take it. And at my last appointment, I had realized that the effects were kind of wearing off. It just wasn't feeling very effective. And so I thought, well, maybe I just don't need to take it anymore. It's not really helping like it used to. And so the doctor said, no, let's just increase it a little bit. And I had never increased it. I had been on the same amount of milligrams these past couple of years. So I just thought, oh, I never thought about that. <laughs> I never thought to increase it. She said, oh, absolutely. It's totally fine. 
and she didn't say anything else about it. She didn't give me any warnings. She just increased it and I went and picked it up and I'd had it for a few days and forgot about it. And then Saturday morning, I thought, oh, today's the perfect day to get started on this. I have a lot to do today and I want to be focused in the temple. And so I took my medication and just didn't think anything about it. And it all just made sense. In that moment in the temple, I remembered the very first time I got on the ADHD medication, I was told at that time by the doctor that it takes a few days for your body to get used to um, because it's something new you're putting in your system. So it takes a few days to regulate. So you might feel a change in your blood pressure. Um, you might feel a little bit lightheaded or things going on. But after day three to five, you should feel completely normal. And if for some reason you don't feel normal after the fifth day, then you shouldn't be on it. <laughs> you know, your body's not wanting it. So I remembered that instruction from a couple of years ago and she didn't mention that this time so I hadn't thought about it and it made sense I thought okay she increased the milligrams I just took one right before I came to the temple and it was already kicking in and my body was trying to adjust to it it was something new it was something different that's why I felt lightheaded that's why I felt like there was a circulation issue going on I, I kept saying I don't know if it's low iron or low blood sugar or dehydration but it's something with my blood like I can just feel it all through my body. It just feels strange. And that's what it was. After I left the temple, I felt completely normal. I have felt completely normal ever since. I knew I wasn't pregnant. <laughs> Anyways, I just felt so grateful in that moment. I felt grateful that it was brought to my memory the reason for me feeling that way so that I didn't have to worry. Um, I was grateful that I persevered and I went forward anyways, regardless of how I was feeling. I just trusted. I just had that faith. And I was so grateful that the Lord answered my prayers and that he manifested himself to me in his house in a way that was very personal to me. And I recognized that and I felt so blessed. Um, it was just incredible, <laughs> absolutely incredible. And it would have been so easy for me just to say, you know what, I'm going to sit this one out. And it would have been easy for my husband to say, you know what, I'm not going to make you wait for me. You're not feeling good. Let's just go home. We'll come back another day. And I thought, no, no, we drove all this way to Ogden. We came all this way. You know, we've already sacrificed a half hour of our time. It's going to be another 20 to 25 minutes driving back home. We may as well do this. We're here. It just would have been so easy to not do the work. I just knew with everything we had heard at conference, I just knew this is where the Lord wants me to be. And I made the effort to be here. He's going to bless me. He's going to help me get through this. This is going to happen. And it did, you guys. He showed up. He was there. And he got me through that. Not only did he get me through it, but I had the most incredible endowment experience I've ever had. Amazing. Amazing, you guys. Absolutely amazing. And I just felt so humbled. It set the tone for the whole rest of the day. It was just a wonderful day. And so I've thought about that experience a lot. And I thought about what it means for the Lord to manifest himself to us in his house in ways that are meaningful and personal to us. And I wanted to share this experience to help everyone who watches this realize that you know, when the Lord manifests himself to us, it's not always going to be in this huge grand way. You know, it might not be a personal visitation where he shows up in flesh and bone and we see him and we can feel the prints in his hands. You know, it might not be that we even have a vision where we see him or we see someone through the veil, you know, something like that. Um, it might not even be that we hear an audible voice. You know, all these incredible experiences that we read about in the scriptures of the different times that the Lord has manifested himself to his children. Um, but it's going to be in ways that are very profound and very personal to us, that we will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that was the Lord. That is what happened to me. I know that that's what can happen to you. I know that that is what he wants all of us to experience. And so I'm just so excited to just keep going to the temple and having these experiences. I know a lot of you are probably having these experiences and sometimes they're just too sacred to share. So we just hold them close in our heart. But um, my heart was just so full. I, I really wanted to share that. 
In fact, I think I'm just going to make this its own separate video <laughs> because um, my video is going to be too long as it is. So I think share this in a separate video. But anyways, let me just read to you the scripture that I happened to read today that reminded me that I wanted to share this in a video. So 2 Nephi chapter 26, there's just a few parts of this that I've highlighted. Um, it starts out talking about how after Christ rises from the dead, he's going to show himself to his children. So that is the very first verse right there. It starts out with, Christ will show himself unto you, my children. Wow, you guys, when I read that, I just felt it. <laughs> it's so direct, so personal, that he shall show himself unto you. And the words that he shall speak unto you shall be the law which ye shall do. And great and terrible shall that day be unto the wicked, for they shall perish. And they perish because they cast out the prophets and the saints, and they stone them and slay them. Wherefore the cry of the blood of the saints shall ascend up to God from the ground against them. Wherefore all those who are proud and do wickedly, the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts. And it goes on to describe how that happens. It talks about, um, they shall be visited with thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes and all manner of destructions. The depths of the earth shall swallow them up. The mountains shall cover them, and whirlwinds, which are tornadoes, shall carry them away. Buildings shall fall upon them and crush them to pieces and grind them to powder. So as I'm reading these vivid descriptions, I'm thinking that is pretty detailed. And that would be very difficult to see that in a vision about the future latter days that we live in. But because we live in these days, we ought to be paying attention. So Nephi talks about how he sees this happen and it breaks his heart. He feels very sad about it. He goes on to say that the righteous that hearken unto the words of the prophets. So think about all the words that we just heard at General Conference from the prophet and the apostles. As we hearken to their words and destroy not their words, but look forward unto Christ with steadfastness for the signs which are given, notwithstanding all persecution. Behold, these are they which shall not perish. So, you know, he's building up this chapter. He's talking about all the horrible things he's seen in a vision happening to the wicked in these latter days. But then he says, those who look forward, look straight ahead to Christ for the signs which are given, regardless of everything going on around them, regardless of persecution, what's happening in the world, they will not perish. This is exactly what we were told at General Conference. But the Son of Righteousness shall appear unto them, and he shall heal them, and they shall have peace with him. And I'm feeling it. <laughs> I'm feeling it from head to toe. This is exactly what happened to me in the temple. I felt that the Savior was there with me and he healed me. He made me feel better. And then I had peace. It happened exactly in that order. He goes on to talk about the spirit of the Lord will not always strive with man. And when that time comes, when the spirit ceaseth to strive with man, then cometh speedy destruction. And he says, this grieveth my soul. This is hard to, to see. It's hard to watch this. It just made me think about what I had been talking about in my video message. All of the people in the world who are caught up and trapped, they're enslaved by works of darkness and secret combinations, covenants that they have made with the adversary to get gain in this life. When that day comes that the spirit is no longer with them, that's when they are prey to the adversary. I mean, they no longer have that guidance, that protection. And so it makes sense. They are destroyed because that is the whole purpose of the adversary. He wants to destroy us. He doesn't have our best interest at heart. He doesn't want what's best for us like the Savior does. He wants to remove that protection. He wants to take us out of the presence of the Lord and he wants to destroy us. And so that's exactly what Nephi saw, that when man loses the spirit, when he or she no longer has the spirit of the Lord with them, then cometh speedy destruction. He goes on to testify that Jesus is the Christ, that the Jews and the Gentiles must be convinced that he is the Christ, the eternal God, 
and that he manifesteth himself unto all those who believe him. So it doesn't matter who you are, and he makes that very clear. He, he repeats it all throughout this chapter. It doesn't matter who you are, male or female, rich or poor, bond or free. So if you're locked up in prison because of bad choices, you're enslaved to addiction because of bad choices, it doesn't matter. If you believe in Christ and you call out to him, he will manifest himself to you. He's your savior. He wants to save you. Nephi goes on to say how the savior will manifest himself to all those who believe in him. He says, by the power of the Holy Ghost, yea, unto every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So the Lord does not discriminate, working mighty miracles, signs, and wonders among the children of men according to their faith. The Lord will come to anyone who calls out to him or believes in him. He will manifest himself according to their faith in him. He goes on to say, but behold, I prophesy unto you concerning the last days. He talks about the words of the righteous, how they will be written and the prayers of the faithful shall be heard. And all those who have dwindled in unbelief shall not be forgotten. So it had me thinking about the prayers that we pray for all of our loved ones, for those who we know and care about, who are dwindling in unbelief, who are going through a faith crisis, or, or maybe they just don't have a testimony and they don't know how to get one, right? We all have people in our life that we see kind of struggle and we want to help them and all we can do is pray for them, right? He says in here that in the last days, the days that we live in right now, that the Lord hears the prayers of the faithful on behalf of all of those who dwindle in unbelief, those prayers and those people that they care about and are praying for will not be forgotten in these days. That should give us hope. We shouldn't stop praying. He goes on to talk about how all of the precious things that are sealed up in a book, those who do dwindle in unbelief shall not have those precious things because they seek to destroy the things of God. There's a lot more that goes into that verse, but it did make me think about um, all of the people who seek to destroy the Lord's church or to make fun of it, to mock it, to persecute it, to try to find fault with it. These are all people who, because they seek to destroy it, they do not receive those precious truths. All that is good and wonderful that could bless their lives is kept from them. And then he goes on to say that all those who have been destroyed have been destroyed very quickly, speedily, and the multitude of their terrible ones shall be as a shaft that passeth away. Yea, thus saith the Lord God, it shall be at an instant, suddenly. So destruction comes very quickly when you're not expecting it. He goes on to talk about all the different churches that he sees built up in these last days and how all of the people running these churches have lots of stumbling blocks getting in the way of experiencing the power and the miracles of God. He says the pride of their eyes, preaching themselves up, that their own wisdom and their own learning may bring them gain while grinding upon the face of the poor. So all of these people who have built up these churches and organizations and ministries all over the world, especially here in the United States, just for the sake of having that power and that gain and building it with their own hands and being very proud of that. And this removes them from experiencing the power and the miracles of God. He goes on to talk about how there are many churches during this time that cause envy and strife and malice. Lots of fighting and backbiting and breaking up and division. And then he goes on to talk about the secret combinations even as in times of old, according to the combinations of the devil, he is the founder of all these things, yea, the founder of murder and the works of darkness. He leadeth them away by the neck with a flaxen cord until he bindeth them with his strong cords forever. Okay, this stood out to me because this is what I talked about in my video message. Now, of course, I didn't go into detail. I didn't talk about all the different stories that are coming up in the headlines, but if you look for them, they're not hard to find. They're everywhere. And it seems like every day I get notifications and alerts on my phone from different apps and news sources, publicizing the next story, the next celebrity that just came forward. And you can see that there is a lot of 
war going on right now in that industry. There's a lot of people who belong to that church, right? That whole industry, and they're all turning on each other right now. They're all coming out with each other's secrets, and somebody will share something, and they do a news story about it, and then the person they shared about will come back and share a story about them. And today I even woke up and there was a notification on my phone. I didn't read it. Something about the biggest celebrity that's in the news this week ended up hiring a whole team of people to put together a website to just tear down another celebrity who had outed something he had done. And so they're just kind of going back and forth. We just see all this attacking and fighting and division happening within this particular quote unquote church, right? Hollywood, the music industry. I kind of just group it all into the same thing. It really, all it is is Babylon, right? They take it pretty serious in the industry. And if you want to move up and you want to win awards and be recognized and get better record deals and have bigger tours, you have to make those sacrifices. You have to feed the beast. You have to go through those rituals and perform ordinances and make covenants just like we do in our church. But of course, the adversary mimics everything that the Lord does for the opposite purposes. So all of the things that we do, we see people in the church of the devil doing similar things, but they're doing it in darkness for dark purposes, right? It's the complete opposite of what the Lord is doing. They're making oaths. They're entering into covenants to get gain and power. And I've even talked about just briefly, um, I keep hearing over and over how a lot of people unknowingly get pulled in. They're invited to an event or a private party and they innocently go thinking they're just going to network with other people in the industry, make some really big connections, and they feel really special for having been invited. They don't want to disappoint anyone. So they show up to the party or the event, and at first everything seems normal, and then eventually they get pulled into a room, and suddenly, unknowingly, unexpectedly, they witness something horrific. This is all intentional. They witness something very illegal, very disturbing, and then they're told, okay, you have two choices. You just saw this take place. You can either now support it and become a part of this special club and participate in it, and there will be a lot of benefits for you by doing so, or you can choose to walk away, but because you've seen too much, we're not going to let you walk away easy. We're going to find a way to silence you, even if it's permanently, if you know what I mean. And so a lot of celebrities are coming forward, and it just seems to be day after day, week after week, telling the same stories, just different names, different people who were a part of these events and parties and either witnessed the crime or were a part of the crime or decided to join the club and advance in their career, right? So it really is. It's like a church. It really is. It's it's a religion. You move up in different levels, but instead of moving towards the light, you're moving towards the darkness. And then all of those people who said, hey, I didn't ask for this. I didn't want to witness that. I don't want to be a part of this. I promise I won't say anything. Life is not easy for them afterwards. And so a lot of these people end up having mental breakdowns. Um, they get institutionalized or they get on heavy medications or they just lose their mind and they can no longer work in the business. Either that or suddenly they die in a horrific, sudden, unexpected accident or they've taken their life. But everyone who knows them says, you know, I can't believe they ended their life. They showed no signs of sadness or depression. Everything was going wonderful. Anyways, the more that comes out, the more that we're starting to see these secret combinations at work. Um, there's actual teams of people who are involved in all of these stories. Every time there's a celebrity that passes away in a very unexpected, strange way, um, especially if it's a big celebrity, the same team of people is put in position to handle the autopsy, to speak to the reporters, to be at the hospital from beginning to end to make sure the narrative is told in the way that they want it. And so all these stories are coming forward. All of these witnesses are coming forward in the industry bringing up all of these past events, saying that's actually not what happened and that's not how that person died and it was foul play or it was against their will. Just so many stories that keep coming out. All of the crimes are coming forward. All of the names and the inner circles in the industry are coming forward and everything that they're involved in. And at the same time, you know, you see that nothing's really being done. Nobody's really being held accountable right now. Pretty much it's just the public. 
it's the public, it's the fans, it's social media, it's all of these people exposing their stories and writing in the comments how unhappy they are and they're no longer going to watch these movies or listen to this music or these artists because they're so disappointed, they're so let down. And so that's how we're kind of seeing justice play out right now is just through the public, through the people, just saying they no longer want to support Hollywood or support these celebrities and their movies and go to their concerts, listen to their music. And so stories are coming forward validating that that's what's happening as record sales decline and music streams decline. Followers on these celebrities' Instagram pages are going down by the thousands and more and more continues to come out. It's kind of like the Me Too movement, but with celebrities. And a lot of these celebrities are men. That's what's different about this versus the Me Too movement. All of these men are coming forward who people idolized and wanted to be like and just thought they had everything. And now they're finding out that these people were all slaves. They were all slaves to the industry, to this church of the devil, and they were having to do things against their will. There was no freedom. They had no say or choice in who they date, who they marry, what they wear, what their messages and their music who they associate with. They're told what to do, where to be, and when to be there, and what to say. And so it's crazy to see how all of these people who everyone idolizes are actually slaves themselves, and they're not happy. And they've had to witness a lot of horrible stuff, go through a lot of horrible things, participate in a lot of horrible things because they felt they had no choice. They've seen what's happened to other people who didn't willingly participate, and there's been a lot of fear. Um, It's just crazy, but, you know, it talks about this in the scriptures. Nephi saw our day. All the prophets of old saw our day, and they talk about this in the scriptures, and it's happening right now. So he goes on to talk about all of these secret combinations in the last days, their works of darkness being exposed, sudden destruction coming upon them, but how the Lord still cries out to all the ends of the earth for everyone to come unto him. doesn't matter what you've done. doesn't matter who you are. doesn't matter where you live. Come unto Christ. He wants to be your savior. He's the only person, only person in the world who can save you from whatever it is you're going through right now, whatever bondage you're in right now, he is the only one who can get you out of it so that you can be free. Nephi testifies of that over and over throughout this chapter. And then he says, never does the Lord tell people they shouldn't partake of his salvation and they shouldn't keep his commandments and they shouldn't come unto him. He never says that. He says that it is free for all, all people on the earth. And he commands his people that they should persuade all men to repent. So that's a commandment for all the children of the Lord. For covenant Israel, right, all of his disciples, we are commanded to persuade the world to repent and come unto him. He goes on to talk about priest crafts and how the Lord commands that we should not have any other motivation or purpose for building up the kingdom of God, for building up Zion, other than for the purpose of building it up and doing what's right. And that if our motivation ever becomes anything else, to get gain, to get praise of the world, to get money. He says they will perish just like the wicked. But if we seek after the Lord and we follow him and we look for him and our hearts are pure, we will not perish. We will not be destroyed. And he goes on to say that everything that Jesus does, everything that he teaches, he keeps it plain and simple to understand. There's nothing he does, save it be plain unto the children of men. And he invites them all to come unto him and partake of his goodness. Speaking of his goodness, this caught my attention this week. It says, have angels been dispatched? Those have been my thoughts exactly. I've had that question run through my mind more than once when looking at all of these photos that have been circulating since last weekend. In that last video, I talked all about Revelation chapter 12, and I talked about the dragon. In these photos, you see angels, dragons, swans. Some have even said they see a phoenix. But it really does look like a heavenly portal was opened in those northern lights. 
And there's that number, 3 Nephite chapter 11, third day power in this 11th hour on the photo I took of the Big Dipper in the Northern Lights. And then there was this screenshot, Earth in the clear after sun emits largest solar flare in nearly 10 year cycle. Followed by this breaking news, massive geomagnetic storms remain likely as sun continues to erupt X-class flares. Someone shared this screenshot with me right around the same time. It says the aftermath of the historic solar storm. And there's that pay attention number 144. It's on there twice. It's on the map. And then it's also down below in the views. The Lord has a way of using disasters, whether natural or unnatural, to gather Israel. And the headlines continue to show high-risk flood threats. And speaking of the gathering of Israel and 144, there was that number again on this headline. Now the word that stood out to me on here was Exodus, mass Exodus. The book of Exodus was all about the gathering of Israel. And down at the bottom of the screenshot was the word twisters. Apparently, there is a soundtrack that has been released with a collaboration of a variety of musical artists, and it's called Twisters. Apparently, this movie is about to be released this summer. Interesting that there's a movie coming out called Twisters during a year where we've had the worst, most severe twisters on record. And here was a video that popped up the other day for me. It was pretty interesting. It was a man sharing his story about being a finalist in Britain's Got Talent and how he was offered a contract with the adversary to make his wildest dreams come true and guarantee that he would win the show. He made it into the finals of the very last episode and he declined the contract and did not win but does not regret his choice. There was that pay attention number, 3rd Nephite chapter 11, a reminder to be a people ready to meet the Lord when he comes. And right when I said that, that recording happened to be 11.3 seconds. There it is again, 311, 3rd Nephite chapter 11. Now this was interesting. I took a screenshot the other day when I was putting together a short version of my long video about the Northern Lights. I put out a short on YouTube and the part of the video where I was talking about the older versions of Sleeping Beauty and how the woman named Talia, who was the princess, she had two children, one named Sun and one named Moon, and she gave birth to them while she was asleep in the wilderness. She became pregnant and gave birth. I talked about how the woman is the church and the baby that she gives birth to is Zion. Two babies being born at the same time, sun and moon. Well, that sounds like an eclipse. So I decided to do a search for eclipses and look around the time that the church or the woman gave birth to Zion, the kingdom of God on the earth. In 1836, that's when the keys to the gathering of Israel were restored at the Kirtland Temple. That's truly when the kingdom of God was born on the earth. On May 15th, 1836, there was an annular eclipse. Here's where 15 pops up again. In 1836, there was a 15-week period extending from January 21st to May 1st, where more Latter-day Saints saw visions and witnessed other unusual spiritual manifestations than during any other period in the history of the church up to that time. It truly was a Pentecostal season for the saints. Now, after this season ends, after the baby is born, an annual eclipse crosses from the west over the British Isles. And one year later, the first overseas mission is established in 1837 in the British Isles, Ephraim. And these become the first saints from overseas to convert to the church and travel to Zion to help build up the kingdom of God. 
this church or woman who had been sleeping in the wilderness had reawakened and given birth to God's kingdom on the earth, the gathering of Israel, marked by the sign of a sun and a moon twice that same year. And look at the time when I pulled up the chart of these eclipses, 311, 3 Nephi chapter 11. And that pregnancy was announced in 1831 when the Lord commanded the Latter-day Saints to go to Ohio where the baby would be delivered or born, where the keys would be delivered. The Lord said that the saints would receive his law, be endowed with power from on high, and prepare to share his gospel among all nations. And there was another sign in the heavens to mark this announcement, an annular eclipse of 1831. Now, speaking of this baby, Zion, the kingdom of God, the gathering of Israel, we know this baby has been growing and growing. And here's a screenshot of a really exciting story that I shared on my Happy Lady Facebook page a couple days ago. Here's a screenshot. It says Royal Visit. And it talks about the king of Accra, Ghana in Africa began to explore the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And in doing so, asked to meet with the missionaries and was baptized. He has since donated a lot of land to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now, to really understand the significance of this, because this is huge, I've included a link down below in the video description. This is the same video that I shared on my Happy Lady Facebook page. And the video talks all about why this is such a big deal, especially over in Africa, over in Ghana. The people respect and revere their kings and queens more than they do their presidents. These kings that are coming to Zion have the power to influence nations and really help Zion grow. Now over in Africa, it is exploding with membership. I've talked about this in recent Happy Lady videos, how the mission field is on fire. It is the fastest growing mission field in the world. And this is all prophecy being fulfilled right now. So in Isaiah chapter 60, it talks all about this. So down in verse 3, it says, And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. And of course, this is talking about Zion. Verse 11, Therefore thy gates shall be open continually, that they shall not be shut day nor night, that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles, and that their kings may be brought. And then in verse 16, it talks about how Zion will be nourished by the Gentiles, and that Zion will be nourished by kings. Now, nourishment is what a baby needs to grow. And in order for Zion to grow, it needs to be nourished. And these kings are doing their part in helping this baby grow in mighty ways. And then in Isaiah 49, verse 7, it says, Kings shall see and arise. Princes also shall worship because of the Lord that is faithful. And in verse 23, And kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and their queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth, and look up the dust of thy feet, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. As I pondered this scripture, this came up. It says, What does it mean that kings shall be thy nursing fathers? The idea is properly that of guarding educating, and providing for children. And the sense is that kings and princes would evince the same tender care for the interests of the people of God, which a parent or a nurse does for a child. And that is exactly what this king has done. He has partnered with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in bringing the BYU Pathway Education Program to his people along with the gospel. Anyways, I wasn't expecting to make another video today. I'm, I'm still just editing the other video that you're going to see first. 
but I just wanted to share this message. I just felt like my heart was full from my own experience that I had in the temple with the Lord, my own personal witness, and then reading this scripture today. And it's just amazing how this chapter was a huge witness to the message of this week's video, also to my experience that I had in the temple and all of the things that I've been praying about, all the things that I've been pondering that have been in my heart and weighing on me all week long were all in this chapter. So I am a huge fan <laughs> of reading the scriptures because that is how we hear the voice of the Lord. That's how we hear him speaking to us which is so important when we need answers, when we have offered up our prayers to God and we're waiting to hear back, the best way we can do that and the fastest way we can do that is through opening up our scriptures and reading his words. They become very personal as we liken them unto our day and apply them to our life. So I just leave that witness with you. I leave my testimony with you. I know that as you cry out unto the Lord, no matter what's going on in your life, what's weighing on your heart or who you're praying for, things that you're worried about, whatever it is, if you take that to the Lord and you cry out to him and you send those prayers up to God, those prayers will be heard and they will be answered. I feel that just as the scriptures say that destruction comes speedily to the wicked, so do blessings come speedily to the righteous in these last days. Our prayers are heard and they are answered. We just have to ask. We have to ask, we have to have faith, and we have to be willing to be patient and wait upon the Lord. But as we do, we will see him working in our lives. And those workings and miracles are his manifestation to us of his love in very personal ways. And I'm so grateful for that. I know it's true. And I say it in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Again, I hope you're having a wonderful day. I hope you have a wonderful week and I will see you next time.